to in order to be heard because we live in a world where how many of you have, have watched the news or you know that it's a big topic? Bullying is big now. It's always been a thing, but it seems like it's come to the forefront. Bully, bully, bully. I know my wife works for the school district, and she has parents constantly coming in wanting to transfer their kids from this school to that school because they're getting bullied. They're getting bullied here. They're getting bullied there. Well, how many of you, when you were growing up or you had a son or daughter and, and they were getting bullied, you took them aside and you said, you need to stand up for yourself. You need to stand up. You need to stand up. It's, it's common terminology that we use. We need to stand up. Well, the church is being bullied. The church is, is the devil is pushing us around. The, dirt, the, the, the devil is shoving us and making fun of us and mocking us. And, and it's time for the church to stand up. And this whole series is surrounding Daniel and his life, so we're going to talk about that. But the thing of it is, in order to stand up, we must embrace what comes along with it. And that's one big, huge word called confrontation. You can't stand up without confrontation. You can't make a stand in the world without confronting someone, without confronting an idea, without confronting a logic, without confronting something on the opposing side. No one stands up for themselves and then everybody gets along. If it was that easy, that, that, if it was that easy to stand up, more people would do it. But the reason why we don't want to take a stand is because of that word confrontation. We're going to talk a lot about that today, that we've got to overcome that fear to be confrontational. Jesus confronted things. Now, Jesus was a friend of the sinner. Yes, he was. I can testify to that. Now, he's a friend to the sinner because he was a friend to me, and he still is a friend. But understand that just because Jesus loved the sinner and he loved them and he embraced them and he taught them right from wrong, he never took a back seat from confrontation. He was quick to stand up for what was right. He was quick to stand up and tell people the right direction to go. So we're going to talk about confrontation in a way where Daniel handled it. The problem is, is that with many of us, now uh, you may fall into one of these two categories, but most people tend to, to do that. So don't, don't get mad if you fall into one of these, okay? Uh, because most do. The problem is that many of us fall into one of two bad, bad categories of dealing with confrontation. The very first one is total avoidance. We avoid confrontation at all costs. We don't want to be, we don't want to be a part of confrontation. If we, if we sense that it's coming, we turn and we go the other way. We're unwilling to confront. We tend to rationalize this out by saying, well, it's none of my business. I, I'm just going to live and let live. I'm, uh, who am I to judge? We can't keep standing behind that and, and successfully stand up for God. Amen. You can't, you can't just say, well, it's none of my business because it is our business. Well, that's the way they live their life. Who am I to tell them how to live their life? You're the light of the world. <laughs> Amen. You're the ones called. You're the ones sent with a message. You're the one that's called to stand up. Amen. If we're not, if we're, excuse me, if we're too non-confrontational, then we don't help to move things forward. Things are moved forward from confrontation. I'm telling you, things become stagnant without it. But things move forward with it. So we've got that area, total avoidance. Maybe you're one of those. But then we have the other end of the spectrum, unloving confrontation. Willing to confront, well, actually we'll confront at a drop of a hat, but we do it in a prideful and a judgmental way. We tend to feel that it's our calling to correct everybody because we're always right and they're always wrong. Amen. So you've got one end of the spectrum, people are like, I don't want anything to do with confrontation. And you've got other people that are, they thrive on confrontation, but not because it's a good and healthy thing. It, they do it because it's a self-righteous thing. And they feel like they are perfect and they've got everything down and they just want to tell everybody how it's done. Amen? Now, I know right now you're thinking of people that fit in that. You're thinking of everybody else. You're thinking, I know that one's in avoidance and I know that one. You're just having people pop in your head. Or maybe you're confessing, yeah, that's who I am. I, I'm right, and everybody else has to listen to me. No, there's a happy medium. There's a happy middle. There's a straight and narrow way to do these things right. We can't fall prey to either side. We need to seek God for wisdom on how to confront. Remember I told you this last week, we want to be talking about this. How do we confront in the right way, at the right time, for the right reasons? 
the right time. There's a right way, a right time, and a right reason for everything you do. Every stand you take, there has to fall into that category. So, I'm going to read to you a good chunk of scripture. Now, don't get bored on me and don't go to sleep. Amen? The word of God is exciting. Amen? Yeah. Good amen. Okay, I need a better amen than that. The word of God is exciting. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When we read the Word of God, that's when our blood should boil. That's when we should get up there and thrive because the Word of God is going forth. Amen? So I'm going to read you a good chunk of Scripture right here, but we're going to go back and talk about it. So just buckle in, pay attention, and here we go. It's found in Daniel chapter 4, and it's verse 4 through 17. And I'm going to read the whole story to you. So it's just story time for a minute, and then we'll get back into the message. The Bible says this, it says in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, like kings do. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. We know that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just want to put that in there. That's the Holy Spirit of God that's in him, not the, of gods. Okay. But that's King James. Okay. It says, I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. If it had fresh green, it had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade, and birds nest in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. The messenger shouted, cut down the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump and the roots in the ground. Bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field. For seven periods of time, let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. For this has been decreed by the messenger, it is commanded by the Holy One, so that everyone may know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses, even to the lowest of people. Now, here's where we go. Nebuchadnezzar. He called in his magicians, his interpreters, but they said, we don't know what that means. Can I tell you, they were lying. The reason why they didn't want to tell Nebuchadnezzar what it meant, it's not that hard of interpretation. Read it for yourself. If you studied that for a little bit, you could understand. Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is the tree. He, his kingdom, he's taken over a lot of pieces. He, he spread his limbs out and many people are underneath his rule and his reign. That's going to come to an end. And even the, the Bible, to, even the end of the dream, the messenger himself said why? So that people will know that the most high is the God of all their thing, not a king. It's not that hard of a dream to interpret but nobody on his staff could do it. Can I tell you the reason why they couldn't do it? Because they didn't want to tell him bad news. They didn't want to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar and say, you're in trouble, bad things are coming, and it's coming to you. Because he had a reputation for killing the messengers of bad news. Nebuchadnezzar had a reputation. Read it, go, go study this stuff. Nebuchadnezzar had a bad reputation of killing the messenger. How many of you have ever brought bad news and you've said that? Don't kill the messenger. Well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't go by that. Nebuchadnezzar often killed the messengers of bad news. So all of these people that were on his staff, all of these magicians and, and astrologers and people that study all these different things, they couldn't tell him. It's not that they didn't have the brain to tell him or the knowledge to tell him. It's because they had the fear of confrontation. They didn't want to tell King Nebuchadnezzar, this is bad and it's bad news. And it's the same thing we do as a church. We do that often. We don't want to tell people bad news. We don't want to tell them that they're in sin. We don't want to tell them that the life they're leading that, that is going to where it's, it's not where God wants it to do. We want to tell them everything's okay. We want to love on them. And yes, you can love on them, but 
There's a such thing as tough love. And tough love is honest. Amen. Amen. Now, I read you that big chunk of scripture. I'm going to read you a big another chunk. Then I promise we're going to move on from this. But I've got to share you the story because then you won't know what I'm talking about. Daniel's interpretation of this. We found out the dream. The dream was a big tree. It spread everywhere, full of animals in the branches and underneath. A good tree, but God's sending someone to cut the tree down and leave the stump. So now Daniel has to interpret this. Now listen to the way he approaches, because this is how we're going to learn to stand up the right way, the right time, and for the right reason. This is how you take a stand against sin. This is how you take a stand in this world against all the ways of the world. This is how you take a stand the proper way. Now, a little FYI. At this moment, I know last week we read Daniel was about anywhere from 12 to 15. At this moment in time, Daniel, scholars say, now you can take scholars' word for, you know, whatever. But, but understand, scholars say that about this time, Daniel was about 45 to 50 years old. So he's grown. <laughs> he's not a little kid anymore. He's a grown man. So there's some maturity there. Daniel 4, 19, verse, verse 19 through 27 says this. It says, upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. So even Daniel had fear. Because when he heard the dream, he knew what it meant. He knew, if I tell him what this meant, means, it could cost me my head. If I tell him bad news, it's there. Guys, can I tell you something about standing up? You're never going to get to the place where you stand up for God and you just feel this rush of courage and there's never an ounce of fear. There's always going to be fear. There's always going to be a moment when you're like, man, I need to stand up for God. I need to stand up. I need to tell them what's right. I need to tell them what the Bible says. I need to tell them about Jesus Christ. There's always going to be that moment of fear that says, no, 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 don't do this. Don't do this. That's the flesh. And it's a natural response to confrontation. Fear. Daniel had it as well as anybody else. He had it, and it even he paused for a moment. That's what the Bible says here. We're going to come back to that. He says he was frightened by the meaning of the dream. Then king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belteshazzar replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would have happened to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. The tree that you saw was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. Basically, he's telling him the dream over again. He knows the dream. But that's why Daniel did it. Verse 22, that tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to heaven, and you're ruled to the ends of the earth. Then you saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump and the roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and surrounded by tender grass, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals of the field for seven periods of time. This is what the dream means, your majesty. And what the Most High has declared will happen to my Lord the King. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. And you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Understand, that's bad news. That's not a typical John 3.16, God loves everyone message. Mm -hmm. This is some rough stuff. This is what's going to happen, King. You're going to eat grass like a cow, and you'll be drenched with the dew of heaven seven periods of time, which means seven years is what that means translated in. Seven years will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone who chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. Verse 27, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Wow. Wow. Talk about standing up. Daniel did something that none of the other little lackeys were, were, were there to do. They could have told him this is what the dream meant. But they were too afraid. So Daniel has to be the one that stands up and says, listen, you're the tree. 
You're the tree. It's your kingdom. It's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. You're going to roam around like a cow, and you're going to graze in the field, eat grass, get covered by dew every morning. That's going to happen to you for seven years. That's going to happen. Now, I've told you before, Daniel got real quiet. He initially doesn't want to interrupt his dream because of fear. He could have done like others and sit this one out, but instead he decided to stand up and tell the king the truth. Please do not. If we have anything in this time, in this area, area that we live, please don't sit out spiritual debates. Please don't sit out moments to witness. Please don't sit it out till a better time. If God opens a window for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone, don't sit it out. Take that moment to stand up. Amen. You may not be popular, but at least you'll do what God's asked you to do. You'll stand up. But listen to the way. We're going to learn these steps. Daniel begins by saying, King, O oh King, I wish to supply to your enemies. In other words, he's showing that he actually, genuinely cares for the king. And basically he's saying, I wish this was not true of you. Number one step to correct confrontation is love. Love. Every bit of confrontation, every stepping point, every foundation of it needs to come from a loving place. If it's coming from a judgmental place, then you're stepping into a Pharisee. But if it's coming from love, you're doing it the correct way. Even Daniel, he loved the king. Now the king was his captor. The king had him captive for his whole life. The king brought him away from his homeland. This guy was not his best buddy, but yet he still loved him. He loved him enough to say, I'm about to bring you some bad news, but I want you to know, king, that I love you, and I wish this wasn't true. I wish this wasn't. We can wish that the people in our lives weren't sinners. We can wish it till the cows come home, but until you confront in love, nothing's going to happen. Amen. You've got to confront in love. So Daniel begins to confront. Now, Daniel tells the truth. He says, even though it's bad, and he says, your majesty, you are that tree. He didn't, he didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't say, well, it could possibly maybe mean that you're the tree. I'll pray about it, but it could possibly. No, he cut to the point. You're the tree. You're it. No cutting around. Guys, we're going to have to get to the point where we're straight with people. And we just tell them the truth. Your, ma your majesty, you are the tree. He says, you'll be driven away from people and live with wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. He says, seven times will pass, which means seven years, till you understand that God is God and God is the ruler of everything and not yourself. He's trying to teach you humility. He basically shares all that bad news. Do you realize in all of that part where Daniel's talking, he started with saying, King, I wish this wasn't you. But then he says, but let me tell you the truth. You're the king. You're going to lose your kingdom. You're going to behave like a wild beast. This is what's going to happen. It's going to happen. God said it's going to happen. But here is the, the straight and narrow. This is it. This is the truth. You can't have a confrontation that doesn't start with love and then immediately lead to truth. Because you can have a loving confrontation and love and be like, I love you and love you. But if you never show the truth, then you're doing it the wrong way. The truth is, people are sinners. The truth is, sin is bad. Sin will send you to hell. Hell is real. Jesus is the only way. If we had more gospel people and more preachers around the world, whether they're, whether they're behind a Sunday school lectern or, or whether they're behind a pulpit or whether they're on TV and preach to millions, if we had more that would look into the camera and simply say, sin will send you to hell and hell is real. But they don't want the confrontation of it. Amen. They'd rather dance around it and hope people get saved. That's not the way to do it. That's not the way to stand up. You've got to tell the truth the way it is. Lay it on the line. If they're doing something wrong, don't wink at it. Don't make them feel good about it. Don't, it's not your job to get them to feel good about sin. Amen. 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 It's our job to confront. So the next step is to confront with the truth. Now what's the third step? The third step. We've got love. We've got the truth. Then let's look at what Daniel does. Then Daniel tells the king some good news. He laid the truth on him. He said, now this is what's going to happen, king. You're it. 
You can get ready to eat some grass and behave like a cow because it's coming. That's the truth. But then he gives him some good news. Then Daniel tells the king some good news by saying, the command to leave the stump of the tree, which is the roots, means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Amen. He gives him some encouragement. The next step is encouragement. You got to start with love. Love has to lead to the truth. But then once the truth is said, you need to give them encouragement. This is how people fail at doing confrontation. One, you have ones that avoid it. The avoiders. They're not going to do anything. They're going to love from afar. They're going to whisper truth from afar. They're going to whisper encouragement from afar because they don't want it. But then on the other hand, you have encouraged, you have people who, who take away love, take away encouragement, and just lay the truth on people. And I guarantee you've been around them, or maybe you've been guilty of being them, but these are the ones that are like, listen, you're going to die and go to hell. That's the truth. If they die in that state, they're going to go to hell. You can't say that's a lie. It's the truth. But guess what's not there? Love or encouragement. Bunch of sinners, it's where you belong. A Christian should never say that about anybody, any reason, any purpose, under God's green, on God's green earth, under God's uh, sun. Nobody should ever say, well, sinners should just hope they get what they deserve. Because if that sinner gets what they deserve, then you should get what you deserve. Amen. 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 The reason why we love gospel and the reason why we love Jesus and the reason why we love God is because we don't get what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve. We get what Christ deserves, what he bought for us. Amen. Amazing grace. Well, Pastor, there's a lot of wicked people in the world. Yes, and that sometimes you were one. I was never wicked. You were born in sin, just like anybody else. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. So we can't escape. We can't just be truth tellers. We've got to do it with love, truth, and then encouragement. He encourages the king. He says, king, not all is lost. This is the truth. This is the truth. And I want to break it down to the people we talk to. You can say, hey, I love you. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about the choices you're making. But I want to tell you, the choices you're making, they're against God. They're against his word. They're sin. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to pat you on the, hat, on the head and say, God loves you. No, he does love you, but this is sin. This is against God. But, even though all that's true, but God gave us Jesus. God gave us grace. God gave us this amazing gift, the blood of Jesus Christ, that where all that stuff can be brought away and everything can be restored. That's how you stand up effectively. Daniel has the courage to do something that literally risked his life. He stood up to the king, not because he was proud of himself, not because he was arrogant, not because he wanted to correct the king and took that opportunity, oh, this is my time to really tell the king what for. No, he didn't do that. Not because he thought he was better than the king. He stood up to the king because he loved the king. And he wanted the king to know the goodness of his God. Four step. You've got to give correction and direction. Direction. Never, ever, ever, ever embrace confrontation. Try to bring correction into someone's life and never give them direction on how to do it. Amen. How many of you hate being told you're wrong? If you don't raise your hand, you are lying in the house of God because there ain't nobody who likes to be told wrong. Everybody likes to know they're right. Right? Amen. Every husband is right. Every woman and, and wife is right. Every teenage kid is right. They're all right. It's amazing how everybody in the world can be right. No. There are some people who are wrong. Amen. And they don't like to know they're wrong. I don't like being told I'm wrong. If I say, well, this is what I want. I want to do something. I hang a picture on the wall. And I'm like, I don't really like it there. Heather comes in, that's wrong. I don't like it there. And no, it's not wrong. It's not right for you, but it's right for me. <laughs> right? <laughs> why do we come up with stupid lines like that? You know why? Because we don't want to be wrong. Amen. So we try to make it our right. That's craziness. Guys, there has to be direction. Now, if she would come in and say, 
Honey, that's wrong. Now, I mean, well, what's wrong with it? First of all, it's crooked. It's upside down. There's problems with it. It needs to be fixed. Then she gives correction with direction. Amen. Daniel gave direction. Then Daniel says this. He's already told the king, it's happening. You're wrong. It's going to happen. He did it with love. He did it with the truth. He did it with encouragement. But now he gives direction. Then Daniel said this, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. That's direction. In other words, I care for you. I want the best for you. And then he says, stop sinning and do what's right. Amazing advice. Amazing direction that's just as relevant today as it was back in Daniel's day. Daniel said, King, I know this is bad news. I know you don't want to hear that you're wrong. I know that you thought everything is peachy keen, but it's not according to God. I'm here to tell you I love you. I'm here to encourage you. But can you please just take a minute and listen to some of my advice. Stop sinning and do what's right. Amen. How revolutionary would it be if every gospel outlet in America this morning looked into their camera, to their Facebook, to their congregation, to whatever, and said one message, stop sinning and do what's right. Revival would spark out everywhere. Why? What do you mean stop sinning? I don't sin. I didn't kill no baby and I'm not gay. I'm not a sinner. There's more to it than that. Amen. Stop sinning and do what's right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Stop oppressing the people. Now he's not only giving him direction about his personal life, he's giving him direction about how to be a good king. See, when Daniel got the boldness to stand up, he might have said, you know what, I'm already here. Let's go for the whole enchilada. Let's do it all. King, your problem is you got to stop sinning. you got to stop living outside of the Word of God. You've got to stop and yield and surrender to Him. But also, King, break away from your wicked past. You don't have to be who you were yesterday. You can be someone brand new today. Guys, that is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ if I've ever heard it. I'm not who I once was. I was a sinner. I thought like a sinner. I talked like a sinner. I did everything like a sinner. But when I came to know Jesus, he changed my walk. He changed my talk. He changed everything about me. He told me, stop sinning and live for God. Do what's right. Get a hold of me. Follow after me. And things are going to get better. And he told me, I don't have to be that anymore. A lot of times why we fail in conversation is we don't give direction. We give people good advice. We say, hey, you need to stop that. You need to quit messing around. You need to give that stuff up. But we don't tell them how. How? How did I get set free from the things I did? It wasn't a program. I'm not, I don't have anything against programs. I, I think they have good and they do good for, for a lot of people. So don't think I'm anti anything. But I know the real answer. I know the real. If you want to get total freedom, it's in Jesus Christ. Someone had to tell me, call upon his name. Lay down your old life. Come to him. Lay down everything. Confess everything to him. Give it all to him. And he'll take it away. He'll redeem you. He'll bring you up. He'll transform you. He'll make you a new creation. Somebody had to give me direction on how to do it. So he says, listen, you don't have to be who you once were. Get away from that past. Get away from it. And then he says, and change your policy. Be merciful. Be merciful to your people. Have a little mercy with people. Now he's getting into the kind of king he was. And he says, perhaps... You will continue to prosper. Daniel didn't give any solid things. He said, listen, if you repent. He was trying to tell King, King, we've got the dream. We've got the vision. We've got it. But God is merciful. And if you repent, if you're honest to God, it could change. God could change his mind and do something different. If you acknowledge him now, maybe you can avoid all that bad. Daniel's trying his best to plead to the king. It reminds me of this verse, and I know I've got to hurry. I'm going to go real quickly, Robert, or Kevin, sorry. So 
Get with me. <laughs> I'm going to be going fast. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into that same temptation yourself. The New Testament gives us this advice. He said, listen, if you see somebody in sin, he's like, it's not your job to spread the rumor. It's not your job to let everybody else in the church know. And not, it's not under the guise of prayer. Don't do that stuff. That's hypocrisy. And that's a Pharisee's attitude. Amen. If someone says, well, I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but I want you to help pray about it, say, well, just be quiet right then. You pray, I'll pray. I don't have to know nothing to pray. Amen? I don't have to know any details. Why? Because the one I'm talking to knows all the details. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a different sermon for a different day. But he gives us a little bit of, of perspective here. In the Word of God, in, in Galatians 6 and 1, he says this is the way you should do it. Gently and humbly. Be gentle with them. They're newborn babies. They're there. They're, they're just tiny and little. Be gentle. Be humble with them so that you don't fall into it. Stand up. Do it gently. Do it humbly. This is the best way to do it. I'm no better than you. Have this mentality. I'm no better than you, but I want to help you get back on the right path. I'm no better than who you are. Because you're in a place that you could end up hurting you, I care about you. I want to help you get back to the right path. Step up with caution. Caution. Everybody's had with caution, right? You know what that means. Caution. Paul says be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Amen. Be careful because the one sin you're criticizing today, you may fall into tomorrow. Amen. The one thing that you're like, oh, that just makes me sick. Be careful. If that's your attitude for everything, because you know what? It can come around and get you. It's what the Word of God says. That's not Pastor Kirk's advice. That is the Word of God. God said, Paul said, be careful, be cautious, because the thing you're standing against, if you're too prideful and arrogant in it, pride comes before fall. And it can get you. We have to be prayerfully. We have to be prayerfully minded. Never confront because we are right and they're wrong. Only confront to help someone else be right with God. It's not about you being right. It's about them being right with God. Amen. Get a hold of that. It's not about you being right and you being proved. Oh, you're the grand pumba of the church. You're right in everything you do. No. That's not why you confront. That's not why we tell people... You confront and you do it the right way because you want them to be right with God. Them to be right. Now, let's look at the results. i got to hurry up. What are the results of this? What's the results? I wanted to give you the results because I don't want you to come in with anything. Well, I did everything you said. I did everything the Daniel way. And, and they didn't give their life to Jesus. And we didn't have revival in the living room. And it didn't get saved at work. So it must be a lie. No. Understand. Daniel did everything right. But listen, King Nebuchadnezzar didn't say, oh, you're right, forgive me. You're right, Daniel, you got me, man. You're right, man, you got me. No, he continued to rebel against God. And, he, and the dream that he dreamed came to pass. And seven years went by, and the results are up to God, not us. The reason why we don't like confrontation and we don't enter into confrontation is because we think that the results are hinging on us and our ability to perform. It's not. Results are up to God. It's for us to stand up. Daniel did what he's supposed to do. He stood up to the king. He stood up and his life was on the line. His head was literally on the line. He could have lost it all. And seven years went by. Everything Daniel said happened. He lost it. The king went mad. He started acting like a cow. He went out and ate grass in the field. He lost his head. It's what happened. Read your Bible. It's what happened. But what Daniel did is this. This is what he did. He did what he was supposed to do, and he let God take care of the results. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, this is what it says. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, after the end of seven years of being a wild beast running around, he said, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forevermore. Daniel stood up 
still happen. Told him, you're going the wrong way. This is going to happen. This is very bad for you. I love you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to give you direction. But sometimes they don't listen. Amen? And it's just going to become flat for me. I wanted to share that part of the story with you because what sometimes we live in this, I don't know, world we've created that if I make a stand and I stand up, then I'm going to confront, I'm going to do it the right way, and they're just going to get saved, and God's going to show up. And can I tell you, that's within the realm of possibility. It can happen that way. But sometimes you're going to do everything right. You're going to take a stand. You're going to stand up. You're not going to be afraid of confrontation. You're going to overcome that fear. You're going to do it the way you're supposed to do it. And you know what? They're still going to reject it. And they're going to walk away. But see, Daniel, in giving his direction, he told the king, King, one day, you're going to have to stop doing wrong. You're going to have to look up to heaven and you're going to have to rely on God. That's what he told him. It took seven years of acting like a wild animal for him to get it, but he finally got it. And when he did, he listened to what Daniel said. He looked up to heaven, God restored his sanity, restored his throne back to him. Say. So, why is that so important? Because I don't want you going one time up the bat, strike out one time, and you're like, oh, that didn't work, I'm done. No, it's your job to stand up always. It's your calling to stand up the right way, the right time, the right reason. Stand up. Make a stand. Like we watched that video in the beginning, we, if we stand, we rise. If we take a stand, the gospel of Jesus Christ rises. The truth of who he is rises. We've sat down for so long that people don't know the truth anymore. They don't know it. They don't recognize it when they hear it. It sounds offensive to them. But we've got to take our time and take a stand and do it the right way and not care about results. We're so result driven that if we try something one time and it didn't work out like it says, we, we scrap it and we t t go and do a totally, totally different thing. Guys, that's the way the world looks at things. We are not result-oriented. We are God-oriented. Because let me just break any religious bubbles that we ha may have floating around here or on Facebook. You've never been responsible for the results of anything in the kingdom. It's always been God. Nobody's going to stand before God and say, you know what? The kingdom is the way it is because of me. The kingdom is the way it is because of God. See, the Bible tells us that it's our job to plant, it's our job to sow, it's our job to water, it's our job to do what we can to tend, to tend the land and tend the soil. But only God brings the production of that. Only God reaps the harvest. Only Him. We just do the sowing. We do the standing. Daniel went home that day from the palace of the king, probably sad and brokenhearted, saying, man, it's going to happen. The king is... That, that's what's going to happen. He wouldn't listen to me. I told him to stop, but he wouldn't. Now he's down that path. How many of you can say that about a loved one you know right now? You've talked to them. You've shared it. You've done it the right way. You've loved. You've encouraged. You've given direction. You've been honest as you can be. And they're just not home yet. And they're still roaming around out in the wild. Don't lose faith. Don't stop standing up. Keep standing every time you're in their presence. Remind them, stop sinning, do what's right. Do what God asks you to do. Do it, obey God at every chance. You may not be the popular person in your home or at your job or in your social circle. You may not be the most popular person because they're like, man, all the time, they're Jesus this, Jesus that, and they're this and that. I don't care what they call me just as long as they call him Lord. I don't care what beef they have with me as long as their heart is settled with him. And we've got to get to the point where we are confrontational people again. That we stand up for God. Amen? Let's bow our head. Maybe you're here today and say, Pastor, I'm an avoider. I avoid confrontation at all costs. Or maybe you're on the other end of that spectrum. You're like, you know what? I love telling people how it is. I just love telling them this is it and this is that. And just, you know. And there's no love and there's no encouragement. And there's no direction. 
either one you're at or whether you're floating around somewhere in between. I can tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has called you to stand up. God's called you to stand up for Him. Because He stood up for you. He stood up for you. He stood up for you at Calvary. He stood up for you at the grave. He stood up for you in heaven. He's standing right now. The Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, standing, ever making intercession for you and for me. He's standing. So stand for him. If you're here with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm looking around. You say, Pastor, I haven't done the best at standing, but I want to. I want to do better. Then real quickly, real quickly, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Real quickly, right where you are, will you just raise your hand and put it right back in? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Hands going up all over the place. Guys, God's called you to stand. He's called you. Don't worry about the results. You just worry about the message. Just worry about the message. Just tell them about Jesus. Tell them again and again and again. And watch God bring the result. You keep sowing. You keep watering. And let God bring the harvest. It can happen. It can happen. Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you confronted us one day in love. You told us the truth, God. You encouraged us in your word. And God, you gave us direction on how to get there. God, we just pray, give us the same ability to do it here. God, make us people willing to stand, willing to do something, willing to take a stand, even when it's unpopular, even when it's our head on the line. But we'd be willing to stand the way Daniel stood. Lord, help us to stand. And God, when we stand and they don't listen, when we stand and it just seems like every day, every day, every day, we're taking a stand and they reject it, they reject it, they reject it. God, whisper into our heart, whisper into our soul that the results are up to you, not to us. We just called to do everything to stand. Stand, therefore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' holy name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Next week, guys, next week, we're going to be talking about standing strong. We've learned how to stand out. We've learned how to stand up. Next week, we're going to learn how to stand strong. Stand strong in the face of adversity. And everybody has adversity. Everybody. Let's stand to our feet today. Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray a prayer of dismissal. Go out this week and be encouraged. Go out there and stand up and be heard. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything you did, for everything that you, you put into motion this morning. We pray, God, Lord, that you would accomplish everything you want to in us, in this church. God, that we would be people that will stand out, that will stand up. God, that we won't be afraid to stand for you and to stand for your word, to stand for what's right. God, even when it's unpopular, even when, when society doesn't want to hear it, God, make us a voice that will still proclaim it regardless. And we'll leave the results up to you. God, encourage them. Be with them this week. Put your hand upon our church. Help us to grow. Give them all a wonderful week in you, God. Watch over them. Protect them. God, and bring them back to the next appointed time. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Shake hands. Be friendly, guys. You're dismissed. See you next week.